Hi, everyone, welcome. Um, this is the second of your 15 minute espresso intensity conversation today. Um, uh, my name is uh, Pat Kane. We'll do a wee bit longer introduction in a minute, uh, but the way we want to do this is to have a, a good exchange and then hopefully have about uh, five to four to five minutes at the end for questions so we can get through this quickly to we'll manage it. Um, Andrew and I are going to have a conversation uh, familiar to many of you, I guess, about how we want to decommission China and get rid of the nuclear weapons. Now, there's, a, there's an urgent moment in this in terms of the political opportunity coming up with the possible uh, progressive left coalition assemble at, uh, at Westminster post May. Uh, and so our conversation will hopefully kind of illuminate some of the not just the, the political, but also the, kind of the personal uh, dimensions of how we can build that coalition, not just in terms of party politics, but uh, emotionally and personally. Um, so we'll have a conversation um, about how we've come to these positions, uh, and then we'll have a bit of a conversation about that case. So, and just tell them who you are. And by the way, we're life partners, so this could be a very elegant domestic of this morning. So, and yeah, just say yeah, who you are. This conversation comes after a couple of years of real rowing actually about this <laughs> but we've come to this beautiful elegant moment so i'm in drag man i'm a psychotherapist um i'm a buddhist of 25 years um my my heritage is my father's indonesian and coming from a Muslim family my mother was a catholic uh, living in holland so i've always had a very global orientation i've always come from, I don't quite belong anywhere, but I belong everywhere. And uh, the first time I came across the nuclear issue was as a 13-year-old. Um, um, we were in America, and I was still the United Nations. And uh, I, you know, I, I observed somebody talking very passionately about um, why we needed to get rid of nuclear weapons and how nuclear weapons themselves were defining a globe that is at war with each other and uh, emphasizing the separateness of nations uh, that have to be uh, threatening each other in order to have a relationship. So that's how I, that's how I came to it. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, and I didn't even say who I was. So, yes, I'm the therapist, and I'm the uh, director of something called the Soft Power Network. So, I've spent the last 20 years or so uh, exploring soft power. Uh, my name is Pat Kane. I am a musician and a writer. Um, I wrote a book called Play Ethic in 2004. Um, I've been heavily involved in independence politics from uh, the 1987 general election. And uh, I'm currently, as a big part, on the board of Yes Scotland. And I'm currently on the board of Commonweal. Some colleagues of mine from the independence movement, including them, are speaking later on today at this event. Um, and, uh, and I think kind of my personal journey towards thinking about this um, was focused by moving to a place called uh, Gourock, which is in the west coast of Scotland, and which has some of the most beautiful views of the Clyde, you could imagine, and one afternoon going up uh, in 1987, 1988, to the top of the Tower Hill, looking across this perfect picture postcard scene, and uh, slicing right through the still waters of the Firth of the Clyde. A gigantic tribe, nuclear, uh, nuclear submarine, and um, subsequent family vacations to various beaches around about Coolport and Bogalock, um, spreading out the uh, tartan car, standing out the tartan rock with various instruments of mass destruction and living in the distance. So um, uh, that, that's the kind of base interest. But what we want to kind of do is to kind of talk about um, the fact that we've come to this politically from slightly different perspectives um, and having actually been at, at uh, opposite sides in the independence mm -hmm. referendum. So you talk about, I mean, a good thing for you to talk about how in the almost, almost one, the last two or three years, mm -hmm. where that's worked out for you in terms of um, how, how uh, but, you know, contemporary yeah. politics in the yeah. UK figures in relation to trade, and then I'll talk about that and then yeah. answer for questions. Yeah. I mean, it's been interesting because, um, as I mentioned before, um, for me, the issue of Trident is a global one. So, yes, it's uh, a dangerous weapon to have on our shores. Yes, it costs a lot of money. But for me, it's more to do with how it defines international relations. So, of course, um, we see ourselves as a member, or whether we see ourselves that way or not, I'm not sure, but 
we're perceived, I believe, by the rest of the, the world as a member of the nuclear club. Now, some people would say that's a good thing. Some people think that you have power, you have status. But actually, in my view, it makes you the target for you know, all the people who are not members of the nuclear club. And, and worse than that, you know, any kind of disaffected person who feels resentment against power uh, or against the overwhelming power of a very small number of nations, you become a target for that. You become a target for that. So that's my view. <laughs> but, and, but the thing, the interesting thing about uh, thinking about agency to get rid of mm. nuclear weapons is that you know for the last, I would say for the last, what since 1987 for me, uh, one of the great uh, moral uh, ambitions of independence, got the nation state of independence was called, has been to get these weapons off our soil. Now that, that, that there's two aspects to that if you're thinking about it as a as a nation, a nation state aspiration. One is get them off the homeland, you impose them on us, or whoever the you is, anyway, the British Imperial system, impose them on us, so to get them out, let's claim, let's purify it. And this is a literal fact in terms of the leakiness of the missile systems themselves, and, and, and them being transported in large trucks over highlands and bridges in Scotland in the last three weeks. So there's a, there's a, there's a basic fundamental insecurity there. <clears throat> but it's also about global ambition for a small nation. How do you project power in a radically different way from the British state? And I think this is, I must admit, the, the, the moral the purity of, of the argument here from independence has got even more acute, given the adventurism of the British state across both major parties, Conservative and Labour Party. So the whole idea that to, to, this is an act of a critique of Britain as a justification for a certain way of doing power in the world is, is, is burns very brightly at the core of, and I think when a lot of political columnists look at the current situation coming up, <coughs> and imagine that there'll be fudge or compromise one way or the other, well of course you know that this is a red line but it's not really a red line, it's a negotiated position. As far as I know from these people, it's absolutely a red line, it's, it's a moral um, um, standpoint. Yeah. Um, and what I'm hoping is that um, that there isn't a, that there isn't actually a division. What I'm hoping is that that feeling that you have, that passion that you have, that ambition that you have, uh, is 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 more commonly felt across the whole of the UK. You know, and um, in fact, the irony is that um, in all the repeated um, polls that have been done by CND over the years, there's always been a clear majority in favour of getting rid of nuclear weapons. The real sticking point is when and how. And so this idea that at the moment uh, a nuclear weapon is still a deterrent is something which, uh, which has captured the public imagination. So what we're trying to do, and I think you know, and we're trying to work well, together on this now, yeah. Yeah, is trying to reframe the situation, reframe the argument slightly, so that it appeals to more people and has more effect. And you know, it's complicated. You end up not really talking about nuclear weapons at all. You don't talk about the actual destructive nature of, it, of, 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 of an atom bomb. But you end up talking about global politics and national politics. Yeah, yeah and economics and all of that. And in this case, you know, from a soft power point of view, um, you know, I'm hoping, maybe against hope, that Britain, if it was once the problem, can also become the answer. So if it was once wanting to be uh, a leader, a global leader as a hard power, I'd love to think that it could, in one leap and a jump, become a global leader as a soft power. So by becoming, for example, the first completely post-nuclear state, meaning it was once a member of the club, I it was, so. yeah, it now becomes the first post-nuclear state. And that might appeal to uh, the British um, ego, you know, or the, or the patriots, or those of us who want to continue having a, having a place, uh, just, just change the place. Well, I think it would not even have the possibility of this conversation if, and this was the last point before we check out, um, if the response to the independence referendum hadn't been completely the opposite of what I thought it was going to be. For example, long-time independence activists, I thought we were going to be in twice as worse a situation as we were in 1979 when there was a no vote. But what actually happened, and this is very resonant to the change of our audience, is that this time it was a proper movement bearing certain ideals, one of which was, was, the, was the nuclear question. But because it was a movement, it just the momentum kept going right beyond the particular yes no binary decision. Um, and the SP became the, the beneficiaries of that. And, and so we're in a situation where 
it's almost like bring. I was going to say bring two zero, but people might grow and think here. Bring two zero. Oh, uh, bring three zero. But there's a there's a Britain about to come, which I always thought the way I could talk about Britain post uh, independence would be it's seen as a preferred Scandinavia, you know, or Nordic. It would be a, a zone within which sovereignties would be having a discussion about how to be even better than the other sovereignty, you know, race to the top rather than race to the bottom. So what we have, I think, what we have possible here um, is is a sort of I mean I keep but I think it's, there has to be a certain element of how to put it um, self. Self-determining political correctness, as in, I often talk about these islands. So the idea that these islands can have a conversation about anti-austerity or about constitutional change, or about getting rid of China, you know, is is a is a new way to think about um, politics in this part of the in part of the world. But, but I'll be honest, and this is where you really can finally come back on this most of I still have a critique of Britishness, and uh, to me, to me, I'm waiting, I'm hoping uh, that. Um, that there's a sort of spiritual, ethical space within the Malabar bunker you know, <laughs> that they can that they can see this opportunity because it is a real opportunity. Mm. But if, if but they're looking why, at things in terms of existential crisis, but but that's why you know I think that the moment calls for not focus on Westminster, not focus on which politician will be able to make the sums, but on creating the call. You know, to really create the call amongst the people, uh, those who can express themselves on social media of all kind, make the call, create the call, much bigger call than until now has been the case for banning nuclear weapons. And I, think, I think that we might have, we've run out of time really. Oh, well, but what? Do you think so? Okay. Yeah. All right, well, can, uh, any, any questions just showing up from the floor? Because what, what I'm just know that we're trying to get removed serving yeah. activism on the basis. Besides, besides ethics and all that, do you not think the reason at the moment it's so propitious is an easier sell on this? To even UKIP voters or something, it's just, it's just a complete waste of money. Yeah, that's definitely a good sell. And that's well, the it's way it's... It's 90% of it right now, politically. It strikes yeah. me that it is. Yeah. I mean, at the moment, what CND and uh, Acronym and all the other uh, organisations are leading with is, uh, and, you know, trying more jobs, trying more childcare, trying to... And I think the, you know, the, 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 the financial um, argument is a very good one. And yet we still want to appeal. I think for this to be the kind of size of call we're looking for, we want to appeal to people who don't care about what we care about. You know, they care about other things. They're more in a comfort zone. And I think we need to appeal to those people now. Yeah, and just, um, I think we have to deal with the fear factor. If Project Fear was a, was a, was a self-description, or one of the self-descriptions of the most thing, there's another Project Fear coming, which is SNP, Pat Cymru, Green, Labour coalition equals chaos, and part of the chaos is they'll leave, they'll leave you defenceless geopolitically. So there has to be the part. There's a sort of part. Yeah, we have to switch that round. Well, we have this yeah. yes, survey response. So using petitions, using websites, using memes, using videos, using all the techniques that are available to flash a constituency into into space, we've got to try and do it to give the politicians a sense that there's no passivity. One, we get one last question. Oh, okay, that's all done. Thank the you. man in the blue jacket is rough. Thank you very much, everyone.